so just a little update on my website. I have a page called um, Providence. You'll see at the top. And I've just got, I added a lot more maps just to give you perspective and trying to place um, either the three sons of Joseph Smith that did live in uh, Kendall County, which is basically this whole area, mostly Plano, Lake Joseph III got married there, but all of his letters um, say he was in Plano, and Alexander did have one child um, in Plano around 1870s, 60s, so, and of course J.S. Bibbins was down here since 1838 until I think 1890 to look at that and see. So here are these maps you can just see. If you're not from the United States, this is almost all of Illinois. I'm missing the bottom and the very top of it, but um, Navi is just a little bit north of Quincy. So for Emma to visit, she, she had a little ways to go, but Newark and Plano? Really close. So as you see right there, it's really, it's like a 15 minute drive in a car. So with a horse, it's longer, but very, very doable. So, um, as I talked about my last, um, video, I did go to, well, actually these letters, you, you can get special permission. So they're electronically on, uh, the church catalog, but you can't. It's not just anyone that can read these, but, um, so these are some of the letters from Joseph Smith III, where it verifies he's asking her, his mother, Emma, to, to come, and in 1874, he's, like, really grateful that she came, and this is not the whole letter, but she sent him a bed, and really helping him out, because he was having a really hard time emotionally. Um, and then her own letters were the ones that I had to look at microfilm and it just was hours for like three days just in a room that I couldn't bring water or snacks and I'm hypoglycemic and I have pots so I'm supposed to drink water constantly all day so I'd eat a salty lunch and then I just kept feeling like I was going to pass out without water it was a little bit rough not gonna lie but it was worth it I'm just used to any job, like I, I survive because I have water right next to me, I can always run and grab that. So if you're in a room that you can only have to check out all your stuff and show them, okay, I'm only bringing my laptop or my camera in here, okay? So she mentions trying to get her shadow taken and then um, she talks about maybe getting her negative, I've not had my negative taken yet. Which is not really a normal thing to say if you're trying to get a photo of yourself, which she did get photos of herself later in her life before she died, but this actually really sounds like an old photo. She's trying to get copied, so that's huge, really. Um, and then I, you can just look through this to see specifically in 1866 that... Um, her second husband is insisting she goes to Plano. She really misses. She hasn't seen him maybe for eight months. Her grandchildren. And um, she just can't wait to go. But she's saying she's got to take care of, you know, Alex's family. But then you've got from August, October, then she's describing weather in Plano being similar in Nauvoo. So it's like, how would she know if she had not gone? She really wanted to go. And then what's significant, I'll go ahead and go back to my page here. So, I mean, that was, I'm just going to tell you it was August, 1866, October. Um, the sun stamp tax. I made sure I put that in here. So you see how Bibbins' or, um, photography is showing a stamp that was required in between September 1864 and ended August 1866. So I have no stamp, so it has to be after August 
1866, her letter is dated. It's just the irony is crazy. And I threw this in here. So I know it looks odd how I um, cropped this, but I, I tried to line up where this rod is, like it's being draped. So Bivin's background didn't look like this. You know, this is Lucian Foster's background, his camera. And so when he lined these up, and Joseph was about 6'4", some, some people said he was a little bit less than that, but I, I found, you know, like a published article saying Emma was 5'9". So she's quite tall, she's slouching a little bit there, but you can see the distance from there, whereas his head is overlapping, like he's too tall for that background, really, this person. And just this trapezius muscle, the angle of it. Of course, I'm not a forensic analyst, but it, it looks like he's tall. So, um, and just you see, they did to have did tend to have sometimes these really tall backgrounds, and that's what Bittman's had. This is a very tall background, but it's also possible that he had. She's talking about a photo car. This, so that 10 mile difference just attaches a horse. It's very well he could have been in Plano and Emma could have seen JS, thinks of her son or her husband, just that's going to catch her attention. And the name Bibbins is going to catch her attention because she knew Elisha Bibbins changed her whole life, her whole family's life. Very influential. And I've looked this upside down and sideways. It's for sure. Jess Bibbins' dad taught her. And so you see on the map that I got up here. It's at the very top. No. There we go. So this is where Harmony, Pennsylvania, used to be. I messed up and said it was over here for some reason. I was like, oh, happy accident it actually is a lot closer. So it's an hour drive. Um, so he didn't move. I thought he moved from here to here when he got married. But um, this is where J.S. Bibbins was born. This is where Joseph and Emma met. He was working there and stayed with her family and met her and married her. Um, but that's where she grew up and that's where she met Elisha Bibbins. So Elisha Bibbins moves just down there. About 64 miles south. And then 1838, Bibbins' family goes... Newark, Illinois, in 1838. And then Joseph and Emma go to little well, Quincy in 1839. And then a little bit north to Nauvoo, and Emma just stays there till her death. So, but she did leave. Occasionally she did go to Plano. So, it's pretty cool. And this is all just about the same. Um, and then I've just been editing this a little bit to look a little bit better. And I explained, I've done my best to make all of my, I've, and it's amazing how many sources, original sources are online because just so many books are scanned online and, and there are a lot of things. It's, I've just been lucky to have almost all of my questions answered very recently, which has just kept me happier and busier. I like having something to do when I work on this. This is something fun for me. But I'm serious about it, though. Like, I want to get all the facts, right? You know, you can still click here and see the journal entry. And so, you can really see what a monumental task it was for the Joseph Smith papers to put all this online for free. You know, and, and it's free to go to the church history library, but you do need to uh, be a member to access a lot of this newer stuff that I found. But right here, um, I got permission to put this on my website. So it's courtesy of the State Historical Museum of Iowa. You can have a link to go to their website. So it's Victor Cress. And um, when I looked at it, I was just really disappointed until I zoomed in. I know my photo so well that all of a sudden I was like, kind of jaw drop moment. 
so this is just zoomed in, but it's, um, you know, I was able to get a hold of a high resolution copy of the original that this is based on. So the original forward facing painting of Joseph Smith, but, um, and you can always find, you could just go Smith papers, David Rogers painting of Joseph Smith. I always forget to put a link on there. But so one thing that I notice is this is very level. And I think they fairly took a picture of this, like how it the canvas is, this is how David Rogers painted it. It's, you know, of course I zoom in on this, I can't necessarily see as crisp as I was able to see when I zoomed in on this for some reason. But this is at a slant. You see how this is at a slant? And um, so just things that I could really, even though it's not the best done painting, um, there's a lot more, I guess, because they contrast. Whereas everything sort of, there's less contrast. So a lot of these things stand out, but you see how this eyebrow has a little bit of almost like a bald spot right there. I've talked about this before, but it's just like there's the eyebrow and then it just comes up and then you, so that's right on the brow bone. You sort of have a bald, slight bald spot or just thinning in the eyebrow. So it does thin right there. And this is his right eyebrow goes all the way down. But then you do see this very prominent swoop. You see it there, but not there. That's the only thing that's really weird. And you see that on the death mask too, but that's one indication that maybe they had this, but flipped around. I don't know. And I don't know how much of this is just how David Rogers did it. There's just really no way to know but it seems very clear that this painting, this duplicate oil painting, coming from scratch with Joseph Smith III standing there talking, commissioning this with um, Victor Cress, and he has David Rogers' painting to base it on, and the daguerreotype, which is probably turned completely black, which I still have on here. I just have to scroll up. So Emma Smith's 1845 daguerreotype by Lucien Foster is this dark. Now, I don't know how long it took to get that dark, but it definitely was copied, copied clearly in the 1860s on a cartridge of disease. So it's likely, so could have Joseph Smith's original daguerreotype be copied somewhat clearly. My picture's not that clear, but hers is a little bit clear. Um, although the theory that mine is a daguerreotype of a daguerreotype, which then flipped this around, and then a cartridge visite was taken of another daguerreotype flipped around. Don't know. It would be neat to see where that daguerreotype is. <laughs> I'm just going to point out a few more things that I see. So just looking at this today, just everything, thinking about everything that I've found out, it's just... Especially, I just keep thinking, I'm not going to find out anymore. It kind of sucks, but I wish I had this, this, and this question answered. I don't think I ever will. And, you know, August, September, October, November, I have, you know. And so I've been working on trying to get something finished with some people that they do want to publish things that they've researched. And um, whether it happens, I don't know. But, you know, it's kind of like, oh, six months, this is hard hard like waiting but it's like there's like 10 things I didn't know in April you know so it's like it's okay you know I, I just will be more confident if it does happen so a little bit of a bald spot whereas this the eyebrow hairs are covering that brow bone where the orbital brow bone is right there it, and it comes down much lower than there and it's not quite well Maybe it's about the same, but this eyelid, you can see more of it. Whereas this one is definitely, definitely thinner. 
and then you see this line coming down. I always notice that. Maybe not so much that this is my own photography. I just tried different lining and took a photo with a different lens. It didn't come out as clear as I hoped, but I was kind of rushed and busy. But um, a little bit more similar hue as that. So you can see it's a little bit of that line. So my original versions where I put on the scanner, you could see this better. It literally is like a scar line that goes down that way. Whereas right here, it just goes here and stops, but it's very apparent. And then the sharp angle on the eyelid is definitely a lot sharper here. And a little bit more round on this side, same there. And then this eyebrow just goes up. It doesn't trail down like this. This one trails down. His right eyebrow trails down. This one does too. This one really goes up and then, and that's just really super apparent. Even in these, especially this one by Carter, it's like a dramatic, whew, strange, almost S-shaped, but opposite. It's almost the exact opposite of that eyebrow. Yeah, it's just very, very unique, and it's pretty amazing. So I've just got, everything is just about the same. Except we, I did um, go ahead and input Junius F. Wells. This was the other thing, like where is this 1930 um, article, I want to just link it, and I can't, because it's only accessible in church catalog if you log in with your church, so anyone, you don't have to get permissions, but if you're a member of the church and can log in with your church account, you can read this and find it, Yeah, it takes a little effort, <laughs> so I can't just link that, but I just feel, you know, it's just a little bit frustrating that I kept finding the quotes of it, but I'm like, everything else is online. I just like seeing, so this is the actual print of 1930. Um, but what's unique is the, uh, where is the, the 1885 version of Junius of Wells. He says all the stuff he knows about the forward racing painting, but doesn't explain how he knows. But here he's explaining that in, um, 1875-76, Emma died 78, 79, um, but yeah, she was still alive, so that is correct, and she entertained him, was very nice, um, then hanging in her bedroom is, you know, showed him the painting, and he asked about the painting, and she's saying, is it a good painting? She said, no, he could not get a good portrait, it's kind of, you know, just that whole story, it's even more detailed. And then one thing that is very interesting, I'm like, I have to put this in here and just show this since I can't link it. I could quote it, but it's kind of neat just to show you. Kind of clipping from that book. So I got a screen clip there where he had heard that the lithograph, so this is the martyrs painting, which um, shows that lapel that you don't see in any other of Maudsley's painting, but it's that split lapel like my picture, that he had heard that that was based on daguerreotype of Joseph Smith, done by L. Foster, and so he's making the point that it was the end of April between then and the end of June, as I've been saying, so that's, I didn't know this until, like, last month, that Junie Seth Wells did hear that specifically in that time frame, which is two years after that forward-facing painting's done. You know, that he may, Joseph the Third might have used to, I think more than anything, the copied painting is the one I think that was influenced by the daguerreotype, but still, they were just, they were copying painting, an 1842 painting. So, yep, that's about it, but this is pretty exciting, fun stuff to research and find out, and um, I keep thinking. I found everything, and I haven't. Anyway, have a good day.